what has already happened today means that some things are inevitable. We can make predictions about some part of the future, but that's not all we can do about the future. We can imagine. That's the beautiful thing about being a human being. We can imagine things about the future that don't exist today, things we would like to have, things we'd like to create, things we'd like to make happen. And then even after that, we've got a little guest, haven't we? Even after that, we've got parts of the future that are an inevitable surprise. The future is not infinitely predictable. You, no one knows everything about the future, so there are always parts of the future that surprise us. So we're going to spend a little bit of time in the short time we've got today looking at all three of those kinds of the future. But, as I said, our interest is the future of work, your future, what sort of jobs and work are you going to have in the future, where would you like to go, what is the world putting out there for you. But as I said, all good futurists begin by looking backwards. So let's begin with a history lesson. Now, if I had hours and hours and hours, there is so much history to talk about the way the world of work has changed over the last couple of hundred years. It's impossible to cover all of that in the time I have, so I'm going to give you a quick skate over some of the significant things about the history of work. The first thing to know is that the word job that most of us think we have to have in the future, that most of us focus so much on, most of our politicians promise us they're going to create more jobs. That word didn't even exist before the year 1800. There was no notion of going to a job, there was just work you needed to do. So packaging things in that nice little, nice little bundle called a job is a relatively new thing for human beings. And in fact, as we're going to say in a little while, that process of packaging things in jobs is changing profoundly. And the sorts of jobs that are going to be around for you when you leave here are significantly different than the sorts of jobs I was told about when I was at school. So this is what the original industrial movement was focused on. Once we came up with this idea of a job, the question was, how did a job fit into our life? And in the 1850s, this was how a job was supposed to fit into your life. The job was what you did for eight hours, so that you could enjoy eight hours, spending the money that you earned on the job, and then you would sleep for eight hours. That was how a day was supposed to be organised, according to us, in the 1850s. And as we'll see, that world has changed profoundly. Let's have a look at how much it's changed. We can do this in lots of ways. Let's do it with my personal story. I won't ask you to try and find me. Anyone want to find, try and find me in that picture? Anyone want to have a guess? Which one? There we are. You got me. There I am. We didn't call it. We didn't call it Year Ten in those days. It was called Form Four when I was in school. And there I am standing there in my school uniform with absolutely no idea of what I was going to do. None at all. I was doing maths and science because back in those days boys had two choices. You either did maths and science or you went off and did a trade by and large. And I wasn't very good with my hands so I did maths and science. I had really no idea what I would do and I've had a quite varied career. I should say at this point it's clear from these slides that I've got a presentation here and I'm going to happily keep talking for the whole of this session. If any of you are brave enough to interrupt at any point, pop a hand up and I'll be happy to elaborate a little more or answer some questions. And I'm certainly happy for anyone who wants to approach me at any time since I am part of a school here and ask me about my career. But I can tell you I had absolutely no idea what I was going to do when I was sitting there in year 10 in 1967. But I'm just going to pick one example from my working life to give you an idea of how much things have changed in the recent past. And that is that in the 1980s, I worked for Ford Australia. There's me standing on Sydney Road at the front of the plant. And here's a little indication of what it was like to work for Ford Australia in 1983. 
6,000 employees on the basic wage. When you joined the company, you got two hours induction. That was all you got. And you worked according to a very, very rigid timetable prescribed by the employer. And the fun part at the end of the day was standing next to the time clock. The biggest challenge in the day was how many time cards could you punch through the time clock in the one minute between 4 and 4.01? Because nobody wanted to work the one minute overtime that came from being the person who punched their time card in at 4.01. And so they had this great little system of standing there, all massively trying to get their cards through the system, because that was the rigidity of working in 9.83. 30 years later, what did Ford look like? 30 years later, Ford had a third fewer employees earning about twice the basic wage, making more cars than they made in 1983. It took three weeks to get inducted into how to work on the assembly line at Ford, and the plant worked far more flexibly than it had done previously. That was how much it had changed in those 30 years. Of course, those that know anything about the car industry today know that in 2018, there is no longer any Ford at all. Nobody is making cars at Ford. Oh, yeah. So that's how much one workplace has changed throughout my working lifetime. When I quit the corporate world and become a futurist, this was how the age described my move. That's me. They couldn't understand what I did. Why would anybody leave a good corporate job such as the one I had to become a futurist? The only way they could describe what I did was to call me a dropout. Not the most flattering thing, but it's a nice, interesting example of mixed feelings. You find yourself on the front page of the paper that you're described as a dropout. You might like to think about what the, how you feel. I wrote to them and said I hadn't dropped out of anything. I thought I'd dropped in to something new. I thought I'd dropped out of it. We could spend a lot more time on the history. The best way I know to do that is to give you a quick stereotypical view of what the world was like, what I was told the world was like in 1967. When I was your age and I was at school, this is exactly how I told, I was told my life was going to play out and how my sister was told her life was going to play out. My life was, as I said, you had two choices. At school, you either studied and became an academic, or you got yourself a trade and became a tradesman. Then you would get yourself a job, but you'd work for 40 hours or thereabouts from 9 to 5, Monday to Friday, until age 65. At age 65, someone would hand you a gold watch, and you'd move into blissful retirement, lying on a hammock drinking beer and three years later you would be dead because the average life expectancy of males at that age was about 68 or 70 years old. It's gone up by about 15 years since then. My sister was told, yes, you can go to school and maybe when you leave school you might be able to get a job as a secretary or a nurse or something like that. You might spend a little bit of time but we all knew the real reason that you were on the planet was to have children and raise a family. After your children were old enough, you might be allowed to go back to work for a little while, but that was only so that you could wait for your husband to retire when 65 came along and the two of you would sit around and you'd, you'd be left a widow because he would die before you. <laughs> <laughs> Women have outlived men throughout human history, they still do. The women in the room are going to outlive the men. Sorry, guys. They, they've got about a five-year head start on us. <laughs> Back 50 years ago, <laughs> So that's what the past was like. Now, there's so much more that could be done about the past, but we're interested in the future. But before we get to the future, let's spend a minute or two in the present. Let's just spend a minute or two looking at 2018. There's so much that could be said about 2018 and what the world of work is like. All I want to do in this part of my presentation is just 
dispel some myths about what the world of work looks like in 2018. You've got a terrific careers website with all sorts of information about the world of work. You've got Miss Cameron and all sorts of resources to help you understand it. But my job today is to dispel a few myths. The first is the myth that what you're probably going to get when you leave is a full-time job. Not true. In 1978, 84% of all jobs in Australia were full-time. By 2018, we're down to 68%. Two-thirds of people only in this country have a full-time job today, and that percentage is reducing every day. Many, many more people are needing to put together what some people call a portfolio career or a modular life, which is a combination of all sorts of bits and pieces of work that some people call part-time jobs. <coughs> so yes, those of you that are desperate to get yourself a good full-time job, about two-thirds of the jobs out there are like that, but about a third of you are going to have to think about how you're going to put your life together in a, pre -pack in a differently packaged way, because those full-time jobs are disappearing. The second myth I wanted to spell is that most of you are going to work for those big buildings in the city with their name on the top of the skyscraper. That's simply not true. There's a graph of the size of businesses in Australia. Most businesses, overwhelmingly, businesses in Australia are small, employing 1 to 20 employees. The fraction of businesses employing more than 100 people is that tiny yellow sliver. And it doesn't just apply to the size of the business. This is the range of jobs that are available. The great majority of jobs, nearly half, are available in those small businesses, 1 to 19 employees. Large businesses employ about only about 30% of people in Australia. So when you're thinking about where you're going to work, what you're going to do, what your career is going to look like, you are much more likely to be thinking about small or medium enterprises than you are thinking about those big businesses with flashy signs on the top of their building. And the last thing to say about the present world of work is that if you do what everybody tells you to do, you're probably going to end up in a world of debt because our education system at the moment, if you want to get a tertiary qualification, except with some interesting wrinkles on this nowadays, and it's worth keeping your eye on those wrinkles as governments realise the problem that they're causing for themselves. There are some places now, particularly in vocational education, where it is possible to get these qualifications without needing to settle yourself with a huge amount of debt. But you are going to go into debt. Now what you're told by our politicians is you're going to go into that debt because those who get a good university degree earn more money over the course of their life. And that is true for many people. But it is not true for everybody. So like anybody taking on any debt, it is an intelligent thing to do to think carefully about why you're going to take on all that debt. If I'm going to, am I doing it because I can see how this is an investment in my future? And if I can't, think carefully before you take it all on. Again, I could spend a lot more time talking about the present, but there's my summary of the present. Let's venture into the future. Let's spend a bit of time in the future. And as I've said already, there's no such thing as the future. There are multiple alternate futures. So let's begin in our, of our three kinds of futures. Let's begin with futures we can predict. People have been predicting things about the future forever. And particularly around the future of work and jobs, people have been writing books on this subject for years. I'm just going to flash those book titles up for anybody who's really, really keen and wants to read any of these books on the table here. There's a, a pile of the, the names of these books and how you go about finding them. These are all people who have been thinking about, over the last 20 years or so, how the world of work is changing. And it goes on and on. People have been making all sorts of predictions. You can see from the titles all sorts of things that people are saying they think is going to are going to happen in the world of work. And not only are people writing books about the subject, people are writing books directed at people like you, making predictions about 
what you should do and what are the best jobs that are available. That's an American book, so it's a little not terribly relevant, but I'll let me do some Australian examples. Here's someone who's projected the best 10 job titles for st we have, which have starting salaries of more than $40,000 a year. So anyone who wants to write them down, there's what someone predicts as the best top 10 jobs to get a starting salary of over 40000 in 2018 in Australia. You don't need to write it down. We've got a copy of the presentation here. There's someone's prediction. <coughs> There's one set of predictions. Here's somebody else's. This is a British organisation called Fast Future. This is their list of 10 job titles that don't yet exist, but which will exist by the time you get to the point where you're in the workforce. I'll just spend, see how well you can concentrate without talking for a brief moment. I'm just going to flash through these and let you read them. I won't talk about them, but I'll give you long enough to read each one so you just get a sense of what some people have predicted jobs might look like. personal favourite. So there's absolutely no shortage of people predicting things for you. The challenge for all of you, of course, is which of those things is going to be particularly relevant to you. And that means two things. Which might be available to you, but also which are you interested in? And what might you need to do? If they're the sorts of jobs that are going to be available, what might you need to do in order to get one of those jobs? But prediction is only one thing we do with the future. And in fact, it's not a very reliable thing. Most people who make predictions are wrong. So what most futurists do when they're asked to make predictions is we make 100 predictions, which means we get about 20 of them right, and then we just tell everybody about the 20 things we got right and let everybody forget the 80 things we got wrong. And that's true of all of those books that I mentioned earlier. All of those books are making all sorts of predictions, and if you go back and have a look at them, they roughly get about 20% of it right. And then those who are the best self-promoters get to run around and say, look how clever I am, I've got 20 things right. I hope everybody forgets what they got wrong. Personally, I'm much less interested in what people predict about the future than I am, what can we imagine about the future? I've already said the most wonderful thing about being a human being 
is we can imagine alternate futures. And the beautiful thing about being a human being alive in 2018 is not only can we imagine them, but we can make them happen. There are some unbelievably remarkable things that human beings have done over the course of my lifetime and over the course of yours that have only been done because someone said, wouldn't it be terrific if that was able to happen? I can imagine this, can I make it happen? And the truth is, human beings are now able to make an extraordinary range of things happen. So let's spend a little bit of time in this question of imagining the future. I'm only going to pick a couple of things to talk about, but I couldn't possibly begin this without talking about robots. Everybody's talking about robots. Everybody's talking about what robots can do. There's just some pictures of modern robots, and they're not even the most modern. Some of them are really quite remarkable. And they're particularly talking about these robots, both because how technologically wonderful they are and how sophisticated they are, but also how much of an impact they're having on jobs and work opportunities for young people. This is an absolutely fantastic book. It's a difficult read, but it's a terrific book asking the question about what might happen if these robots that we invent ever become in intelligent enough to take over everything we do. And the challenge of super intelligence is a challenge you are going to face. I'm going to be long gone before we have to worry about that, but you will have to worry. If we can imagine and create all this stuff, what will happen if we create something that is sophisticated enough to do anything we want it to do? And what does that mean human beings will do? There's a real ethical question for you to consider at some point in time. People have been writing about this for a while. This is an Australian author. If you want to know whether a robot will at some point in the future be able to do your job, the answer is yes, they will. Whether or not that means you as an individual human or we as human beings are redundant and useless and meaningless is up to us. If we can make robots do things that we don't want to do, good. Let's let them do them. If we don't want to do them, let them do them. Does that mean there's nothing we want to do? That's the challenge for all of you. When I first worked at Ford, the only way they knew how to make cars was to line people up in a row and get them to shove this bit in here and this bit in here and this bit in here and this bit in here in a line that moved progressively all day and never stopped. By the time I left Ford, they knew how to make machines do most of that, which is why they got rid of two-thirds of their workforce. And nowadays, you can walk around car factories where they make cars entirely in the dark because robots don't need to see. They don't need lights. It's human beings that need lights. So cars are now made completely in the dark because they're made, by and large, almost completely by human beings. The question is, what does that mean for us? Some people are very concerned about this. Headline from The Economist a few years ago that means you're all headed for the unemployment scrap heap. Then there are various people who point out that that's not necessarily true at all. Just because robots can make cars doesn't mean there's nothing for human beings to do. But the challenge for us is to ask ourselves the question, what is it we want to do and how do we go about doing that in a world that's changing as fast and profoundly as our world is changing? And just as you can find all sorts of predictions out there about what robots are going to do to get rid of jobs, you can find all sorts of people talking about what we might need to do in a world in which human-created technology can do a whole lot of stuff that it wasn't able to do 40 or 50 years ago. Yeah? Do you think the advancement in robots and playing jobs being taken by robots is a good thing? Is a good thing? I think it's a fantastic thing. Yeah. When I worked at Ford, in 1983, the looks on the faces of the workers who were working on that production line were, let's put it politely, not very pleasant. They hated it, by and large, but they had to do it because it was the only way they could get the only way they get a job. Many of them had just come off a boat. We had our own boat crisis back in the, the 1980s. 
people would get off a boat and work at Ford. It was the only option they had. So if we can get robots to do those jobs, fantastic. The challenge, though, is if what getting a robot to build a car does is puts human beings on a scrap heap, then we have a problem. The question is, what can we do if we get robots to do it? Education is one thing. That's why I'm here. Why am I standing here this morning? This is a challenge you're facing. And one profound way out of this for you is the quality of the education that you give yourselves. It's not the quality of the education you get at Good News Lutheran College. It's the quality of the education you give yourselves. What are you going to do as an individual and collectively, because you're the voters of the future, to deal with this? But it's your education and the way you approach this that's going to make the difference. If you're going to robot-proof your life, what are you going to do? And before I finish, I hope to have some things to say about what it might mean that you can do. The second thing I want to talk about after robots is the rise of what they call the gig economy. All heard of the gig economy? The idea, no, haven't, is that not a phrase you've heard? Not really? Okay. The, the, those of us that are old enough will know what a gig once meant. A gig was what you, gig was what you guys call a concert. No, oh, yes. oh. Yes. So a gig, well, you went to a gig when some performer was going somewhere. Uh, we would say we went off to a gig. The word <coughs> gig has come to mean that everybody is now in a gig economy. In other words, everything you do, it's not, it's not like a job that you go to Monday to Friday where someone tells you what to do. A gig economy is much more about you performing in some way for someone probably for an hour or two, and then you're probably not performing for the next hour or two. That's the idea of the, the, the gig economy. And you can, if, you, if I just flash these companies up in front of you, these are 10 companies, each of which is worth more than a billion dollars, didn't exist 10 years ago. And most of them are involved in what we call the gig economy. Most of them are not creating jobs, but they are creating opportunities for people to do work of various kinds in various ways, called gigs. This is the trend. This is coming. And this, this book, for anyone that's interested in thinking about the future, is, the, is just come out in the last week, which is a serious research of thinking about what this might mean for young people. I want to... Uh, if, Having recommended lots of books, there is one particular book that I want to recommend that I actually brought in because it's an Australian book. Because when we think about futures we can imagine, the question we need to ask is, what are the industries that are going to exist in the 21st century when you get there? We know what the industries used to be. Ford, car making, used to be a big industry. It doesn't exist in Australia anymore. What are the industries of the 21st century? One way to answer that question is to ask a futurist what it might mean to design 2050. And Peter Eddyard in this book attempts in that volume to answer the question, what are the industries of the 21st century? And here's the sorts of industries that he's describing, that he thinks might exist or might need to exist that don't currently exist. Places where there is work that needs doing and we need to get people in there to do some of this work. One of the points Peter makes in his book is that 70% of the jobs that will exist in 2050 don't yet exist. Those industries here are creating jobs of all sorts of kinds, with all sorts of job titles, some of which you looked at earlier, that don't yet exist. We are going to make it as we go along. That's the beauty of imagining the future. The third kind of the future are futures that come as a surprise, things we might not anticipate. People have been writing books about these two. Here's a couple. Again, if you want the list, they're all listed here. They're quite fascinating books about futures that surprise us. I don't, 
I can think of lots of things that would surprise me. Here's a few things that might come that might be a significant surprise. There's a phrase for these surprises. They're often called black swans. The reason they're called black swans is really quite interesting since we live in Australia. Before Australia was discovered, no one in the world had ever seen a black swan. All the swans in the world that anybody had ever seen were white. Then suddenly they came across to Australia and they found that we'd bred black swans. No one even knew they existed. When, they, when the first settlers arrived here, one of the things they did was they sent these things back to England. And the English said, how did you paint them? How did you, what did you do to create these things? There is no such thing as a black swan. Well, in fact, there are black swans and they exist in Australia. So this phrase, black swan, has come to mean something that could well be out there somewhere in the future, but you have no idea it's out there. And it comes as a big surprise. So people have written books around black swans. Here's a couple of my black swans. One that scares me. We've had a couple of very close calls with global pandemics in recent times. The SARS virus and various other things. The globe is now, even HIV for example, the world is now so closely interconnected that a damaging virus could spread around the world very quickly and do a huge amount of damage. We've come very, very close. Anyone interested in reading the history, you find out just how close we've come in the last decade or so to nearly destroying ourselves with pandemic. On the much more positive side is the notion that we can get almost free energy, such as the energy from the sun by harnessing fusion. What might it mean if we were ever able to technologically generate all the energy we wanted to generate? pretty well free. What opportunity would that bring? That's the notion of a black swan. Something that we might possibly anticipate if it happened it would have profound implications for all of us. And the reason that we can think about black swans and the reason that we have an advantage that robots will never get up to or at least in my lifetime will never catch up with is that human beings are great pattern recognisers. We are able to see things that robots are not yet able to see. We can see patterns in things and we can create patterns in things and allow us to do things that they can't do for us. That's the great talent that we have. That's why we, even with futures that surprise us, we can actually create surprising futures. Okay. There's a quick run of the past. What does all this mean? What does this mean for you? What might it mean? Well, here's my description of how the world's changed in my working life. The 1960s, the world that I grew up in, that little boy in 1967 sitting in his little classroom photo, he was told that the world was going to be very secure. So long as I went off and got a university degree, I'd get a secure job. Someone would keep me employed until, 1960, till, till I turned 65 and I would know exactly what was going to happen to me. I might even be able to progress up the corporate ladder in some corporation and the world would be terrific. But they didn't care whether I was bored or not. So the 1960s was secure but boring. The world that you face is much more precarious. It's much more uncertain. But the beauty of that precariousness and lack of certainty is you've got so much more opportunity to do something that works for you. I think particularly of the girls in this room. I think of my sister and my mother, who really, whose choices in life were seriously constrained because of the way the world of the 1960s thought about the role of women in the world. The role of women in the, world, in the 21st century is more precarious than it was. Some of the things that happen to women today are, are still appalling. They are still paid less than men. They still can't walk across soccer grounds going home after a party without running into trouble. But on the other hand, the opportunities that are out there for you are incredibly profound. You can go to space, you can have the sorts of jobs that my mother and my sister could never have imagined. So that's my distinction of the difference between the 60s and the 2018s. Now here's some quotes from some books that matter, and here I'm talking not just to you, 
I'm also having a quiet word with some of the teachers and some of the adults in the back of the room. We can no longer continue as though the world is going to behave the way I was told it was going to behave in 1967. We, cannot, we can no longer afford to complete our lives using those ideas. Too many careers advisors think of a job as something that an employer creates. You reply to an ad and you do what they want. They think the employer's already created the job. The world of the 21st century, you're going to create the work that you do. You have an opportunity to do the most wonderful things because you're not at the mercy of someone else who's already decided what it is you're going to do. Anyone who thinks they're just going to sit around and wait for an employer to say, I want you, is probably going to starve to death. You're going to have to take the initiative. That's both the challenge and the wonderful opportunity that you face. In the past, we could rely on an employer to drive us through life in the career bus. Today, you've got to be self-reliant. You've got to work out what you want and then make it happen. Or to use a phrase, you're no longer going to be employed necessarily. The skill is going to come in your employability. Your ability to work out what's going on in this gap in the middle. How do you put together this pathway from you to what you're going to do in the future? It's a challenge, but it's a wonderful opportunity. The questions you ask are the questions at the bottom of that slide. What am I good at? What do I really want to do? What types of things have I done well in the past? What interests do I have? What do I do that makes me feel best? What can I do that I enjoy so much that I can't bear not doing it? That's the opportunity. Some people call this becoming a boss of your own company. Creating you and co. Thinking of yourself as being self-employed. Even if you work for an employer, even if you find yourself answering a job ad, think of yourself as creating something for you in that job rather than just doing what someone else wanted you to do. If you feel your work is valuable and enjoyable, chances are you'll attract enough money to make your life work. But finding that is a challenge. So the challenge I want to leave you with is having listened to all this, what questions are you going to ask now of yourself, of your teachers, and of everybody that you interact with in the world? What questions do you need to know to help you work out where you're going to go, what study you're going to undertake, what sorts of opportunities you're going to construct and create? What questions are you going to ask that are going to help you create the future that you want? We've produced a little flyer which summarises all of this and I've got a copy of all of this for you here to take away and hopefully it's something for you to think about as you plan what is the most, some of the most important decisions you're going to make in your life. And I've left five minutes for questions and comments if anybody's got me. Probably easier if we 
try and answer when I ask one question at a time. When biros were first introduced, when computers were first introduced, all sorts of jobs changed. And what happened was, those things were used as a tool by people to be able to do things they weren't able to do in the past. Robots, in their full description, because they do all sorts of things, are just another example of another tool. So if you ask me what I think is going to happen, I think almost all of you, you do already, look at you, you've got laptops and, and palm pilots and phones, you already augment your life with technology every day. Could you imagine getting through your current life without, it's not exactly a robot, but it's not far off. Some of you might have Alexa or Siri or someone at home and you're doing all this stuff on your machine. So my comment would be almost all jobs of all kinds are going to interact with technology in various ways. And some complete jobs are probably going to be replaced by robots. I do think that a Roomba robot can probably vacuum this floor without any human intervention. They can navigate their way around the tables in modern life. I think we could probably do that. But they certainly couldn't build this classroom. They certainly couldn't fill this classroom. So there's always going to be room for human beings. The question is how well do we use the technology? It's going to replace some things, but I don't think it replaces us. I don't see there's any way in which the technology replaces us. There is so much that we want to do in interaction with ourselves and with each other and with the environment. We want to use the robots to enhance that, not to replace it. Anybody else want to go? What? I think we're done. Can we give 